I crouched in waiting along with three other comrades. Clutching my carbine tightly, we were silent, waiting for our prey. No, this was not Vietnam, it was Seattle. The riots had raged for three nights, much like the other rebellions that had scorched across America. These rebellions would leave hundreds of people dead, wounded and imprisoned, standing as a lasting memory of the anger of black America. I did not know, nor did I care, whether I would survive that night, or for that matter, the many other nights we took to the streets to seek our revenge. I entered into this world in the dead of winter. There were four little Dixons and one who did not make it. In 1960, we moved into our permanent Seattle home in a mixed neighborhood called Madrona Hill in Seattle's Central District. The Central District was only part of Seattle where Asians, Jews, and Blacks were allowed to live. At this time in Seattle, Black people had the largest home ownership per capita in the country. I had volunteered for the uh, voluntary busing program to integrate the schools starting in the ninth grade. I came in uh, to have dinner while I was walking uh, past the TV. I saw the news and I saw these black men with, with leather jackets and rifles and shotguns uh, marching on the Capitol in Sacramento. And I was like, wow, never really seen anything like that before. It would be just a matter of years before I would be connected to that invasion. When he came to Garfield High School, all of us young people, you know, we wanted to be there to hear Stokely. Do you think the formation of your party, the Black Panther Party, is perhaps in contributing to the change in atmosphere and making it, in fact, more explosive? Yes, I certainly think so, because this is the first time in the country that Negroes will be organized for their own political interest, and they will form their own party and move along those interests as they see fit. It is unlike Negroes across the country who are registered in the Democratic Party, but are not organized for their own interest. After um, Stokely Carmichael came, I, when I got my Ray-Ban sunglasses, I went to work. A supervisor on duty said, Aaron, would you take those sunglasses off? And I said, no, I'm not going to take them off. He asked me again, Aaron, would you take those sunglasses off? And I just blew up. And I said, no, I'm not taking off my glasses. Fuck you, you white bitch. <laughs> and some other things. And uh, I walked out. I walked out and uh, never went back. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death by an assassin late today as he stood on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King had planned to lead another civil rights march in Memphis next Monday. When white America killed Dr. King last night, she opened the eyes for every black man in this country. She declared war on us. The rebellions that have been occurring around the cities of this country is just light stuff to what is about to happen. America was burning over Martin's death, and we wanted Seattle to burn, too. That night, many of us met at Voodoo Man's house. Voodoo Man was uh, this older brother that had came into the community. We don't know where he came from, but he began to entertain the militancy that we felt. He sent out teams of, of us young people out to firebomb different parts of the city. And he had asked me and another to uh, stay there and help protect the homes. And he gave us some carbine rifles. One of the firebomb teams came back to the house. The police fire, uh, followed them there, and they were arrested. And uh, things were really very tense. We heard Voodoo Man arguing with the police as they arrested four brothers. Dwayne and I thought for sure that Voodoo Man's bloodbath would start right there that night. The cops eventually left. 
The night went on with the constant sound of sirens in the distance. Well, after I graduated from high school, I was involved in this program of recruiting black students uh, for the University of Washington. There were only 30 black students on campus. We all got together and decided that we were going to form uh, a black student union. I met Aaron Dixon at the BSU conference at San Francisco State University. They had, somebody had invited me over there to speak. And so there was a conference of many BSU representatives and stuff. And then I met him over at little Bobby Hutton's funeral. Bobby Hutton had been shot numerous times despite having come out unarmed and with his hands up. He was so young looking. The cries of Mrs. Hutton and the other women filled my ears. I don't think any of us had ever experienced anything as sad as the funeral of little Bobby Hutton. And then later on that evening, Bobby Seale coming over to San Francisco State with Kathleen Cleaver. It was just so powerful and so mesmerizing. There was no doubt in our minds that we were going to be members of the Black Panther Party. Jimmy Johnson, the BSU president at San Francisco State, introduced Bobby Seale who took center stage. We run in a kind of revolution that involves our very lives and it involves us building what we call people's power starting in the heart of the black community to the Chicano community, to the Puerto Rican community, even to the poor white community all over this country, building people's power all over the world in unity with other oppressed peoples and other revolutionary peoples throughout the world. The speech was finally over. Without thought, I found myself moving in a baseline to where Bobby Seale was standing. I just blurted out, we want a Black Panther Party chapter in Seattle. So he took our information and uh, he said he, he would give us a call. Boom, and next thing I know, these guys started a chapter, but I like to say that the Black Panther Party they started in Seattle was the first one outside of the state of California. And they invited me up there. And a week later, he came to Seattle uh, with George Murray, the Minister of Education. You know, we just kind of gathered around Bobby Seale and George Murray, and one of the first things that he said to us was that to be a member of the Black Panther Party, you had to have two weapons and 2,000 rounds of ammunition. You got to know how to clean them, and you got to know how to use them. He also mentioned to us that we had to have, uh, we had to read a lot. We had to read two hours a day. We had to have political education class. Uh, once or twice a week. And uh, towards the end, he says, okay, who's gonna be the defense captain? Fingers were pointing my way. It was as if no one wanted the responsibility for leading what lay ahead. I felt like a little trick had been played on me. Okay, Dixon, you're the defense captain. I want you to come with me back to Oakland. There's a lot of shit you have to learn. I'll sell it to you for 50,000 plus. We don't hate nobody because of their color. As you look at the cracks. We hate oppression. The, the cracked toilet of destruction. Loopholes of shit burns your eyes while the piss flows towards your toes. We hate murder of black people in our communities. 50,000 plus. We hate the gross unemployment that exists in our communities. The set screen cracked due to the circumstances beyond your control. Suffering life idle in this 50,000 plus crib. We hate black men being taken off into the military service. This private hell, or maybe a bastille of black culture. Keep it that way, it's beautiful. Of course, I was very nervous when I was on the plane and uh, I had my Panther uniform on and, uh, you know, I got to the airport. I met uh, these two Panthers, uh, Captain uh, Robert Bay, Captain Tommy Jones. The first thing that they wanted to do was show me their arsenal of weapons. And we get over to West Oakland and then we drive up to on Grove Street down to the front of the office and I see the secretary told me that and I was to stay with Robert Bay and Tommy 
and they would show me around. Whatever nervousness I had was quickly diffused uh, by the friendliness of these comrades and how they greeted me. We want nonviolence, just like Martin Luther King. But to sit and watch ourselves to be slaughtered like our brother, like he was shot, etc. We must defend ourselves, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. Uh, this was a Friday evening. I had been in uh, Oakland for, you know, a couple of days. That's when they introduced me to Panther Piss, which is dark port wine and lemon juice. And we're in the kitchen smoking Brother Ruggie, which was the uh, code name for marijuana. And then we hear a loud bang. We run into the room, and Landon is sitting up there with his 44 Magnum. He had just shot the TV out. And Robert Bay said, man, why'd you shoot the TV out? He said, I got tired of cowboys always killing all the Indians. So then they said, OK, let's go on down to West Oakland and get something to eat. The six of us found ourselves sitting in a soul food restaurant on 7th Street in Wood in West Oakland. After Orlando and I finished, we went outside and stood on the corner to light up a couple of cools. We watched the crowds of black people on this warm spring Friday night. We didn't register that we were standing on the very same intersection where Huey had stood on that fateful night with one pig dead and another wounded. Police say Officer Fry's murder is the first time an Oakland policeman has been killed in the line of duty in nearly 20 years. A huge manhunt is on for the second suspect in that killing who is still at large. Ben Williams, KPIX News in Oakland. But we did notice the police cruiser slowly driving past. And Orlando starts yelling, you know, and cursing. You know, you pigs, you motherfucking pigs, you better stop at the stop sign. Now, you got to remember, this is only a couple of weeks after the death of little Bobby Hutton. So there's a lot of tension in the community. I joined in. You motherfucking pigs, better stop at that sign. Landon and Randy and Tommy and Robert Bay, they come out of the restaurant to see what all the commotion is. And two cops got out. But Tommy, who earlier had taken a Red Devil by this point, was non-functional. Within minutes, Five police cars were on the scene. Tommy somehow slipped his small snub nose 38 to Orleander. As the police poured out of their cars, hands on their guns, I heard Robert say, spread out. Even though I was uh, afraid of what was going to happen, I, 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 I was glad I was there. I wanted to be there. I didn't want to be anywhere else. Shops and stores in the area closed their doors. People began running. Fear engulfed my entire body. And I remember my, my childhood flashing before me while I was standing there with my hand on, on my weapon. Within minutes, the streets were empty, except for a few prostitutes who would refuse to leave. We ain't going nowhere. We're going to stay out here with our brothers. They arrest Tommy, they take him down, and then they uh, turn their attention towards us. Orleander was standing to my right, legs spread apart, toothpick still dangling from his mouth, semi-smiling. Robert Bay to my left looked like an unmovable object. Landon was out in front, his right hand on that big 44. The lieutenant uh, focuses his attention on Landon, and he has his hand on his gun, and he says, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to check you. And Landon says, no, you're not going to check me. And he starts walking towards Landon. Suddenly, Landon slipped and stumbled on the lid of a garbage can. The rattling sound reverberated, puncturing the tension and silence. Something happened with that garbage can top because it seemed to break the ice. It seemed to break the tension because the police stopped. They turned around. They didn't say anything to us. They got in their cars, and they drove off. Moments after the pigs left, some prostitute friends took our weapons for safekeeping in case the cops came back with reinforcements. We split the scene. This was my initiation into the Black Panther Party. We're asking the black community general uh, not to respond to the vicious attacks that the police are making upon our people. Uh, we feel the Chief Gaines and uh, Mayor Redding uh, would like to uh, provoke the community in responding violently so that they will have an excuse to come into our community and brutalize and murder our people. Well, I was uh, told that I had to go up and visit Huey in the Alameda County Jail, so somebody dropped me off. Finally, my name was called, and I made my way up to the window. 
They are sitting in a tiny space on a round metal stool with a short, thin, light-skinned brother. All power to the people, comrade, he said, raising his clenched fist. All power to the people, I said as I awkwardly bent down. How are things going in Seattle, comrade? The movement in Seattle is growing day by day. And one of the things that he said that really stuck out to me, he said, you never turn your back to the pigs because they'll shoot you in the back. After that final statement, we both raised clenched fists. It didn't seem right that the most important man in the movement was sitting in limbo in the Oakland jail. Self-defense is not only uh, using a gun or using your fist, but self-defense is also uh, a strategic and hasty withdrawal. Uh, I've, I explained the meaning of the sky's the limit in this specific case, and uh, this is only another way of responding to the uh, institutions that uh, the sky's the limit, meaning that we will exhaust all political and judicial institutions in order to get justice. When I came back from Oakland and joined the Black Panther Party, my dress now was army fatigue jacket or a uh, leather jacket, combat boots. And then I did start to accumulate some weapons uh, and, and put them in the closet. And uh, that's when my, my, my father stepped in and said that, you know, we can't have these weapons here and that you're gonna have to move. And that's when I moved out uh, and I took all my weapons to my girlfriend's house. When Gwen got pregnant, uh, she, she didn't tell me. She told my parents. And my father said, Aaron, Gwen tells me that she's pregnant. But what are you gonna do? I said, I, I, I don't know. He said, well, you're gonna have to marry her. And I said, no, I'm not, I, I'm not too young to get married. I'm only 19, I, I'm not ready to get married. And uh, he told me if I did not marry her, I was not ready for fatherhood. I was not ready. I was too young. There were too many things that were going on in my life. Uh, and I was immature in many ways. You know, I wasn't even at the hospital when my son was born. The Black Panthers called a meeting in Oakland to protest the police raiding a meeting that they held last night. But the news conference that they called this afternoon was quickly overshadowed by the disappearance of Bobby Seale. R.J. Engel, you're Mr. Seale's attorney. When's the last time you saw him? I saw him this morning, approximately 9 o'clock. Would you describe uh, the situation? Perfectly normal. We uh, discussed going to court, and he was getting dressed to go to court. Uh, we discussed my giving him a ride to court. I had to take off early because there was something I had to do in court. And he said he'd see me there in a few minutes, and uh, that's the last I've seen of him. Bobby Seale's wife, Artie Seale, claimed she was completely in the dark about where her husband might be or what might have taken place. No, I have no idea where he is. In fact, another reporter told me that he didn't show up and that a bench warrant was uh, out for his arrest. Are you worried? Very worried. The Black Panthers are angry. That's not particularly new. But Bobby Seale is missing, and that is different and new. This is Ed Arno for Eyewitness News from the Black Panther headquarters in Oakland. I was arrested and incarcerated for conspiracy charges with Bobby Seale and actually 12 other people. And then Bobby Seale and I stood trial together in 1970-71. One July morning, I headed down to the office. When I turned the corner, seven or eight police cars were parked in front of the office. And uh, when I got there, they said, is your name Aaron Dixon? I said, yeah. They said, well, you're under arrest. And I asked, what am I under arrest for? They said, for stealing a typewriter. The accusations might not have been entirely untrue. Uh, one of the uh, uh, older brothers that had been involved in the party, we later found out he was a police informant, uh, said, hey, Dixon, I know where we can get a typewriter. Model City's office is going to give us a typewriter. I had carried that very typewriter into the office, apparently an unwitting participant in a classic setup. And word spread to the community about my arrest, and then my brothers and some other members of the party organized a rally at Garfield High School. I never had any fear or hesitation about stepping forward and organizing and leading. And so uh, I quickly moved into action 
and said, okay, get, get everybody organized, get them lined up, we're gonna march down to Garfield High School. The word spread rapidly and the community was enraged. Our lawyers were up there. In fact, Aaron's lawyers, uh, they were, they were uh, two of them were white lawyers. One of them was uh, uh, Mike Rosen. And he was up there with a news reporter, uh, Don McGaffin, who was one of our allies. And, um, and so when things started to get crazy, they were right across the street at the Bulldog restaurant. Uh, I dispatched a team of, uh, of Panthers to go surround them uh, so that, you know, they wouldn't touch, the, touch these cats because they were white cats and they were our lawyers and, you know, and, and, you know, allies. And so we were trying to contain it as best we could. Um, but people were mad that the captain of the Black Panther Party had been arrested. And I can remember hearing these voices, free Aaron, free Aaron. I was asking people to be calm and not, not to get upset, not to cause a riot. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. A, a riot broke out that night at Garfield Park. And this riot was the first major riot they had in Seattle. It lasted for three days and three nights. Firemen were later issued flak suits of bulletproof mesh to protect them from snipers who continued to shoot from rooftops. Nearly 3,000 were arrested, and authorities had to open abandoned jails to house those netted by the police. It took the appearance of 14,000 troops to bring an end to what both Negro and white leaders called insurrection by hoodlums. That summer, we sent out teams of fire bombers and snipers with the purpose of closing down racist establishments. One such establishment was the Plus Seattle Tennis Club on Lake Washington. Each time they reopened, we firebombed them again. We also sniped at the fire station around the corner from the office to keep the fire trucks from going out to douse the blazes. Yes, the Seattle Police Department put a $25,000 contract on my head because there was so much firebombing going on and so much sniping going on that they were getting pressure to put an end to it. And they felt the only way that they could end it was to have me killed. We were proud that Seattle was ranked number one in firebombing and number two in sniping. The Panthers had put Seattle on the map. That was one time that the police had surrounded them. They called down the headquarters down in Oakland. I'm the chairman of the party, you know. I can't have my party members killed if they don't have to be killed, you know. I says, I want y'all to surrender. No, chairman, we're not gonna let them run us out. I says, wait a minute, man. I says, wait. Well, we voted, chair. I says, my God. I said, I hereby give you a direction. Well, we're gonna violate that directive, chairman. It ain't that we don't want to disrespect you, but but we don't think, well, and they stood their goddamn ground. <laughs> and finally, the police left. <laughs> and the charges were dismissed against them. And they were acquitted in a jury trial. If that's the case, then what's wrong with having Peltier return to the United States? He saw him being sought as a especially strong leader of the American Indian movement. People are very fearful for his life if he were to return to this country. Plenty of people were supportive of our chapter. People dropped off money, office equipment, sometimes even weapons. When Jack, a short, stocky, blonde, Scandinavian-looking dude, showed up, we were inquisitive in spite of our skepticism. He was decked out in three-quarter length black leather coat and a black beret. Hey, my name is Jack, he said. I belong to the Communist Party on Mercer Island. Yeah, I fought with Che and Fidel when they landed in Cuba. He taught us revolutionary tactics, including how to make time bombs with a stick of dynamite and an alarm clock in a shoebox. The plan was set. Jack would get the dynamite from his contact. We picked him up without incident. When we got near, a cop car put on his flashing red lights and sirens. We were all nervous, but Jack was sweating like a madman. Luckily, a platoon of Panthers had seen us get stopped, which spurred the cops to let us go. That was a close call. 
One night, these same comrades, along with Curtis Harris, decided they would escort me home from the office, which I found unusual. And we started walking uh, down 34th, and a police car drives by. One of these guys, Curtis Harris, he pulls out a 45 and he starts shooting. And moments later, Curtis and the other two had disappeared, and I was alone. And so I was there like by myself, and I said, shit, what's going on? And so I started running, looking for a place to hide. I ran up into uh, uh, this family's backyard, the Melanson's. Within minutes, I could hear cars filling the streets, and I could hear the voices getting louder. I pulled out my 9 millimeter and braced for the worst. The, the owner of the house, Mr. Melanson, he saw what was going on. He came out on the back porch. He signaled me to come in. I ran in with my piece in my hand. We could see the cops frantically searching for me. I observed Mr. Melanson for many years. When Elmer and I joined the party, Mr. Melanson ordered his children not to have anything to do with us, which was understandable. He was the last person I would have thought would risk his physician and his family to save a crazy revolutionary, and he will forever remain in my heart. Going through all types of physical and mental torture. But that's alright. You can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. You might run a liberator like Eric Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. And if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain. You come up with conclusions that don't conclude. Comrade Aaron, this is June. I'm calling you to inform you that Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton was killed by the pigs this morning in Chicago. Fred Hampton's security chief, William O'Neill, was an FBI informant. O'Neill had given layouts to the FBI and to the local Chicago Police Department to Fred Hampton's home. Also, he put some Secondol in Fred Hampton's drink. Secondol is a downer. It makes you drowsy makes you sleepy. There was a knock on the door at 3 in the morning. Mark Clark, 19-year-old uh, defense captain, Chicago chapter, goes to the door, says, who is it? Shots rang out. They go, the bullets go through the door and kill Mark Clark instantly. The ATF and the Chicago pigs burst through the front and rear doors, lined up the Panthers who had been sleeping on the floor, machine gunning several of the surprised comrades. Uh, they go into Fred Hampton's room, uh, his wife is six months pregnant. She lays on top of him to protect him. They grab her by her hair and pull her out. She tried to wake Fred, but Fred was drugged. They go back into the room and three shots. They shoot Fred Hampton in the head while he's asleep. He's 21 years old. I looked out into the streets clutching my shotgun, wishing a pig would show up so I could blast away. It was without a doubt the most devastating piece of news I had heard since joining the party. Black people need some peace. White people need some peace. And we are going to have to fight. We're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace because the people that we're asking for peace, they're a bunch of megalomaniac warmongers and they don't even understand what peace means. And we've got to fight them. We've got to struggle with them to make them understand what peace means. And known to us at the time as part of COINTELPRO, the FBI initiated a campaign of sowing dissent among the Black Panther Party leadership, and the FBI forged derogatory communiques to Eldridge, supposedly from Huey, and sent inflammatory letters to Huey, supposedly from Eldridge. Eldridge demanded that the Hilliard brothers be expelled, mainly because of the heavy hand they had used in expelling and disciplining members of the party. Huey refused to expel the Hilliard brothers and instead expelled Eldridge. This division between Huey and Eldridge became known as the split. Taxpayers' money was used to discredit, demean, and in J. Edgar Hoover's words, neutralize black liberation movements. I don't uh, know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, they're lying. 
They're trying to destroy the leadership of the party. You know, for, in the past, they've trumped up charges on me, myself, and many others. Uh, they trumped up charges even on Oakland 7 and many people. And uh, they're trying to destroy the Black Panther Party. You know the Black Panther Party is a moving force for the revolutionary struggle that's going on for change. Uh, the pig power structure is being exposed by breakfast for children, free health clinics, you know. If it hadn't been for Huey P. Newton, there never would have been any breakfast for children. And they know it. In many ways, there was two parties because there was the party uh, that wanted to go out and do guerrilla warfare and kill the pigs. And then there was a party that was pragmatic, that said we had to organize the people. We have to get the people on our side. We had to raise the, the political consciousness of the people. And we did that by implementing the survival programs, the breakfast program, the free medical clinic, busting the prisons program, the free shoe program, free clothing program. And these programs we actually did win over the masses of the people to our side. And Elders Cleaver was kind of like the main uh, proponent that was always talking about guerrilla warfare. He's a land vipers scoundrel. He's a rogue. He's a reprobatable black man of the worst kind. The acts that he's committing against the Black Panther Party is criminal, and that we say that he'll be judged with, and he will be dealt with by the people because he has placed himself in the same light as the persecutors of uh, good people. Serves as Panther headquarters in Oakland. Fortunately, no one was in the building at the time, but there were witnesses to the shooting. And within hours, acting on a citizen's report of gunfire from a police car, officials had investigated the incident and suspended two officers, charging them with felony assault using firearms on an inhabited building. Eldridge Cleaver arrived and seemed to express the outrage felt by all. Do you know these two this officers? This is his behavior. I don't need to know them. I know that they're on the Oakland Police Department. The entire Oakland Police Department is out of order. Chief Gaines has suspended these men and uh, arrested them, but just watch and see what he does to them. See if they're sent to the penitentiary right. trying to send here a penitentiary. Arrested for a felony and uh, fired from their jobs in the police department. Chief Gaines, did the officers admit that they had done the shooting? No comment. Huey, Bobby, and the Central Committee had decided to centralize the party in Oakland with the eventual goal of taking control of all aspects of the city. Bobby Seale and Elaine Brown announced their campaign to run for mayor and city council person for the uh, city of uh, Oakland. Uh, we expect way over 6,000 people to uh, uh, come down and get their free bags of groceries and also to register to vote, uh, to unify the vote around the very concrete program so that in the future, the black community and other poor oppressed people in any kind of vote will be unified around concrete survival programs like this so the people won't be asked, asked by the uh, uh, politicians to endorse them, but the politicians will have to endorse people's community survival program, such as free food, because people got to eat every day. This is a new approach for the Black Panther Party, isn't it? It's not per se a new approach. It's some new kind of work. It's all related to our original vision, though, of the Black Panther Party over six years ago. It's in the Black Panther Party organizing this kind of operation really shows that we're implementing the original vision of the Black Panther Party. There are a lot of grocery items still to be put into these bags, the biggest one being a fresh chicken. That'll be put in at the last minute tomorrow. The Black Panthers estimate that the value of each of these grocery bags is in excess of $10. Ed Arno for Eyewitness News in Oakland. Chapters and branches throughout the country began sending most of their members to Oakland. The party had an open sexual relationship policy, meaning that brothers or sisters could have sexual relationships with as many partners as they wanted to. This policy seemed to work mainly because there was so much uncertainty from day to day. During and shortly after the most heated period of attacks against the party, pregnancies would rise. Free's order stated that no party members could have any more children until further notice. So if a sister became pregnant, she was required to have an abortion. This freeze lasted almost six years, with only one exception. Erica Huggins was granted special exemption and allowed to have a baby. There were always more women in the Black Panther Party than men. 
and always more women in leadership than men. I mean, I was there 14 years, so it was a huge part of my life at that time. John Huggins and Alprentis Bunchy Carter were assassinated by an arrangement orchestrated by the FBI. When John Huggins was murdered on January 17, 1969 at UCLA in broad daylight, our baby was three weeks old. For me, personally, things only got worse. A young lady who had uh, joined the Black Panther Party, she ran away from home, which was a common thing to do. Her and I had a relationship. She got pregnant, and she had a baby. And this was my second child. This was Nasset was her name. Of course, when Gwen did find out about it, she was, you know, upset. Naturally, she was upset. Her mother joined the Nation of Islam and moved to Chicago. And I was always thinking about her, wondering where she was, what she was doing. And, uh, you know, I did, didn't see her again until she was 13 years old. I just noticed that a lot of girls were chasing him all the time, which is cool, you know. Now, I, don't, I, don't, I ain't worried about no sisters and brothers when they get together. Hey, that's humanity. The right to make a choice to make love and express sexual affection with each other is our right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a memory I have of Aaron, how he was with women and children. Absolutely present and fair. What was awkward was that I was the captain of the Seattle chapter. When we moved down to Oakland, she became my supervisor in the legal defense program. It was torturous for me to see her moving on, but I had brought it all on myself. There were some comrades, mainly men, and mainly in leadership positions who abuse this policy. I got disciplined behind some things that I said to Gwen because she was my supervisor. I disrespected her. One day, John Seal and his comrades asked me to come into the photo department and close the door behind them. Calmly, John said, Gwen told me that you had disrespected her. As I was sitting on the corner of a desk, explaining to him why I had cursed at Gwen during a disagreement over some procedures. I was blindsided and knocked to the floor and began pummeling me. It was over within minutes. For the first time as a party member, I had been physically disciplined. For four years, I had been captain of the Seattle chapter. Now I was a line worker. And the fact that she was having a relationship with, uh, with John Seal uh, because we had broken up uh, because of the birth of my daughter. I didn't realize it at the time that Huey really was trying to run me out of the party. It was very difficult, uh, but you know, I uh, was dedicated to the party. And uh, you know, it, it was gonna take uh, more than that to wedge me away from what I was dedicated to and involved to. I just put it behind me and uh, just continued moving forward. Things only got worse. Gwen had left for Seattle, taking Aaron Patrice with her. When I contacted Gwen in Seattle, she threatened to disappear and never allow me to see Aaron again. I sank into a deep despair, wondering if I would ever be reunited with my son. Huey Newton has been in jail since mid-October of 1967 when he was arrested for the shooting death of Oakland policeman John Fry. He subsequently was convicted of voluntary manslaughter in connection with that case and sentenced to a prison term of from 2 to 15 years. But an appeals court overturned the conviction on the grounds that the trial judge had made an error in his instruction to the jury. The situation then now is that Huey Newton is legally eligible for bail and that he cannot be retried on a charge of murder. Uh, I have absolutely no power as an individual. Uh, the power is with the people. Uh, so the real question is, that uh, what are the people going to do? I said that we're going to unite and uh, become very strong, and we're going to uh, free all political prisoners and prisoners of war. We'll free the Solidad Brothers Three, that's cliche, 
uh, Drumgo, Fleeter, Fleeter Drumgo, and uh, George Jackson, and uh, all of the other uh, brothers there at Soledad, uh, and uh, uh, white prisoners also have a case, because the prisons are not rehabilitation centers, uh, they are no more than concentration camps. If you have the power, And then he comes out of prison. Now, he, when he went into prison, the Black Panther Party was about 15, 20, 30 members, people that he knew, people that he grew up with, family members. He gets out, now he's an international hero. You know, he's an international superstar. When he came out of prison, all the elements were there waiting. Huey's drug use and paranoia was dissecting and destroying the party brick by brick. A lot of people do not realize that Huey, when he got out of prison, he was suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And at that time, there was no diagnosis for post-traumatic stress syndrome. But before he went to prison, he had been stopped over 50 times. And, and when they were patrolling the police with guns, this is like being in a war. It got out of hand because uh, Huey became uh, uh, addicted to snorting cocaine. Not only that, he, he became uh, super paranoid and uh, very egotistical. We were all paranoid, but when he gets out, he became paranoid because he didn't know who to trust. When Bobby left, there were already very important people who had been run off. Like, he tried to run me off you know, by having me, uh, having my wife being put over me. I think that's why he kept me out of the security unit, even though there are people asking him, Aaron needs to be part of this. He would say no. He kept me away from him, which I'm glad he did, because there was too much going on. And the closer you were to Huey, the hotter things got. We shook hands that we'll always run this party together. We are equal leaders. Well, what does that mean? I said, it means we got multiple leadership. I said, and we're going to have to have it all across country. What are we going to do? I said, yeah, we're going to have an organization all across country. Well, I don't think we need our... I said, well, I'm sorry. I'm, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm organizing. Yeah, but if I object, I said, you can object all you want. That's what I'm going to organize. Well, uh... And, and what if uh, I get people to vote you out? I said, you know what, Huey? Fine. Then I'm going to go out by myself and still organize me an organization all across country. It seemed the party was falling apart. And now, without Chairman Bobby, Huey slowly wandered down the path of no return. I remember being ordered to leave Central Headquarters at 3 a.m. to get Huey some coke. Everything came to a head shortly thereafter. In 1974, a warrant was put out for Huey's arrest on the murder of a prostitute. The pimps and hustlers had also put out a $25,000 contract on our leader's head. Huey and his wife, Gwen Fontaine, disappeared. I'd also like some answers as to how Ruben Salazar was killed. The media have not helped. And we demand an answer, and we don't think that the sheriff's department will answer that, can answer The people that are armed with weapons, you have a much more serious confrontation that is being faced. Everyone knows the United Farm Workers Union has remained and has always been a nonviolent organization. Yet violence of, of that nature is being perpetrated against them. I think the situation is so serious that it calls for this kind of a move. There are programs that are detrimental to the community that, that, that have been supported essentially by the city and put upon the people by the city with really uh, very little understanding on the part of the board members. And there are programs such as the Senior Citizens Transportation Program, which we've mentioned, which we attempted to get pushed through this board or pushed through the city, and which the city rejects through its various bureaucratic rules and so forth and so on. It's very difficult to talk about anything so concrete as someone here being given some side money, but it is very easy to see that the Model Cities program, after three years of operation in the city of Oakland and in West Oakland in particular, has done essentially nothing for the people other than put in some uh, streets and a few bus stations that will protect people from the rain partially.
Somebody had to take over, and Elaine is a brilliant person, very smart, very sharp. She had a vision for uh, the party in terms of moving forward and taking over Oakland, so she stepped right in. I don't think anybody else could have done what she did. Now, the greatest sacrifice that I had was when Elaine told me that I was going to be her assistant and her bodyguard. I had to be with her, you know, all the time. I had to make sure she was secure. But she was an extremely demanding person. She was a perfectionist. We had some b uh, bumpy times, and I was pretty hard on him, I would say, in the beginning. After a while, we worked very smoothly together. I understood Elaine's vision for the party probably better than anyone else. But I also knew that she could be ruthless, particularly towards disobedient men. Some certainly deserved it. Some did not. I had witnessed the male chauvinism in the party in the early days, how elders got away with beating Kathleen. Since her rise, Elaine had changed all that. We were on a campaign trail, and we had been up late, and uh, we were driving somewhere, and uh, she said something to me. She cussed at me. I cussed at her back. Uh, and then she said, I'll take that 45 off of you and hit you upside your head. The next day, I was ordered to go up to where Big Bob was and to get 25 lashes for respecting Elaine. When I got there, the lights were low. A.D., you got 25 lashes coming for disrespecting Elaine. Take off your shirt. If it had been a man, I, maybe I wouldn't have cussed back at him. So I could understand or because there was some male chauvinism in the party. Okay, I said to Big Bob slowly. The large penthouse had several thick pillars in the living room. I grabbed one in the middle of the floor and planted my feet, ready to receive my punishment. Uh, nobody wants to get hit 25 times with the whip, but uh, this was my punishment, and, uh, and I'm gonna take it like a man, like I've had to take everything else. By the 13th lash, I began to feel the pain of the leather slicing to my back. I let go, hoping Bob would have some sympathy. A.D., put your hands back up. I reached back up, and the lashes continued. For a split second, I felt I was elsewhere, in another place, another time, in the hull of a ship or on some plantation. Then it was over. Big Bob gently began to swab my wounds with alcohol. A.D., you can't sleep with any community sisters until your wounds have healed, okay? The party had a strict code against telling the outside world about this. Larry Bethune, Elaine, and I caught a plane up to Seattle. But the other two people drove, if you follow me. We met Elmer at the Seattle Chapters Community Center. Tensions were very high. Elaine wanted Elmer to come back to Oakland, but Elmer refused and kept requesting to speak with Huey. I knew all too well that the people I was with could be extremely dangerous. I also knew that he was my brother and that he wasn't going to let me get shot. We were heavily armed. I knew that we weren't going to let him get shot. While we talked, we kept hearing noises. Even though the office was empty, Larry wanted to investigate, but Elmer steered him away from the other rooms. The conversation heated up, turning antagonistic. Elaine was not used to Panthers defying the hierarchy, but Elmer refused to back down. So Elaine, Larry, and I decided it was best to retreat. With our hands on our weapons, we backed out. As Elmer confirmed for me years later, he had situated heavily armed Seattle Panthers, including our younger brother Michael, throughout the building. A single move could have resulted in a bloodbath. The interesting thing about that piece is that Aaron, that's his own brother, stood with the Black Panther Party. Aaron knew that. He was there with them, and he stood against his own brother. So I think the significance of that was where his brother was in violation, um, Aaron stood with the Black Panther Party. He had no idea how organized we were and that, that um, we would be ready for them. Secretly, I was proud of the way he stood up to Elaine, but I worried that this was not over. As dedicated as I was to the movement, I was not about to stand by and watch my brother be eliminated.
In the summer of 1965, Elaine visited Huey in Cuba. He said, save the party. Save the party. Because everything was, people felt everything was falling apart. Huey had devised another plan for capturing Oakland. In order for us to take over Oakland, we're going to have to use the electoral, electoral process. Because why? Why is that? Because the people are not ready to pick up the gun. And the only way I felt I could do that would be have a very, to have that hardcore of men that he had developed, which included Aaron. Upon her return, Elaine approached former Superior Court Judge Lionel Wilson about running for mayor of Oakland. Despite having any real political ambitions, Lionel Wilson was a highly respected, very distinguished looking black man. Recognizing all of that, we said we can win this election. He agreed to run. When we came in with the vote, we had 45, 46% of the vote. This was unheard of. Oakland was a Republican white city. Lo and behold, the party ran Lionel Wilson's campaign and won, electing him as the first black mayor of Oakland. The Panthers were finally in City Hall. So Lionel showed that he was prepared to be the mayor, and he was prepared to be our mayor. And that was our ticket to making the next step. And so that was, he was absolutely critical. Nobody else could have won like that. Lionel got the labor union, he got everybody. He had everybody. And what he didn't have, I brought him, we brought him. And what he didn't have that we brought him was the black community vote. Elaine was in the mayor's office almost daily, helping to shape his policy and strategy for improving conditions of Oakland's poor. I told Lionel what we had agreed upon. And that was, you only have three things to do for the Black Panther Party. You have to make sure that we, we have a connection to the police chief. That's our police chief. Secondly, we want the city manager. It was a city manager government. We want to appoint the city manager. We're going to tell you who's going to be the city manager. And thirdly, we want to have a majority on the port board, which he appointed. Elaine often hosted parties for the comrades at her penthouse in the Oakland Hills. There was a sense that our time together was coming to an end. I was feeling that it was coming to an end, that the party was coming to an end, that my time in the party was coming to an end. And I was trying to gather myself uh, and trying to figure out how I was going to get out. I was beginning to wonder about my own future. My son, Aaron, my daughter, Nasset, I had seen her only once. I felt trapped. At the same time, I also felt that here with these comrades was where I would always be, where I had to be. I sat back and watched the comrades dancing wildly, as if in some kind of trance, as if this was our last dance together, the last dance of the Black Panther Party. Generations and critical, the real black panthers ain't dead. I'm living proof. Gather up my disciples, load up some rifles, and go to war with the soul of Stokely Carmichael. We the brothers of the Quran and the Bible. You listening to the 10 point program recital, or should I say revival? We're no longer idle. Back on the streets teaching black survival. Repping the section of the map and the time zone. Training troops to bust the Mac with their eyes closed. Live by it, die by it, that's what I know. So I might as well give my people something to die for. Let's put an end to the faking and the profiling. Get with the movement that the OGs co signing. The system must be fucking with that coat diet. But we about to cause some more quote unquote riots. Quiet.